Hey everyone, I am so thrilled to be here talking to you once again in season 2 of The Thing About Wildlife. Welcome back. For those of you who've been following us since June last year, it was so heartwarming to have heard from you in these months between the seasons with your ideas, feedback, or just general enthusiasm and anticipation for more content. Your continued engagement has kept me really driven to keep this podcast going and it's given me so many ideas as well. Season 2 is my experiment with one of these ideas where I take a step back from our longer more biographical episodes and talk to a wide range of people who work with nature. And I'm hoping to bring you their snappy stories uh over the next few months about 15 minutes at a time. with of course the exception of today's episode where i'm taking the liberty of chatting you up a bit more with this being the first episode in a long while you may have also noticed that i have moved from saying us and we in and our in the context of the podcast like akshay and i used to and i'm using i a lot now and that's because both akshay and i are in the thick of doing our phd's and akshay is now so swamped with field work that he's chosen to take a slight sabbatical from the podcast not to worry his amazing mesmerizing voice and ideas are going to be back pretty soon uh but until then i'm going to try and do justice to him and his contribution so far as well and while i miss him sorely and wish i had a co-host i am just so happy to have the opportunity to keep this going nonetheless so akshay you are missed and i'm sure the listeners will miss you too but i'm looking forward to when we can do this again and he is of course always there in the background supporting me constantly and he's just always there for me to run ideas by him and brainstorm and give me feedback and so it is still technically us and it's still very much our baby but you'll be hearing a little more of me than us in the next few months and i hope that's okay <laughs> Um so now on to the meat of season 2. Welcome back dear listeners or welcome for the first time those of you who haven't heard us before and thank you so much for tuning in. This is the thing about wildlife in a nutshell where you will hear a bite-sized story from our guest wildlife first time in their field. Our lives among nature tend to be a string of funny, intimidating or simply absurd anecdotes. and i'm going to be bringing these to you through some wonderfully diverse and fascinating voices a quick aside to say thank you to tanya gill for the lovely music that you're listening to in the background of my voice today you'll be listening to a conversation i had with the kind and fiercely passionate niharika gogoi a phd student with dr narayan sharma at cotton university in guwahati Her work focuses on the gorgeous capped langur found close to where she lives in Assam where she studies how their diet varies across wild and human occupied areas. However, she uses every bit of her spare time she has to learn more about the landscape she lives and works in and has contributed to several biodiversity surveys and has been very vocal both through the spoken and written word about various conservation issues in this region. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. So you're from Dulia Jan, and your place of work is also very close to home, and in the nearby forests. So, what has that experience been like for you? You know, what is, what is it like to work in a place that you know so closely since your childhood? Well, uh, <clears throat> since I was born and brought up in here, um, I kind of know the how people talk, how people behave. I kind of know their body language. and that's kind of important when you're working so close in in a forest you know alone also uh, since i was born in dulia jan i was um, very close to the dingpatka forest since i was growing up like making frequent trips to dig boy that road you'll always cross the uh, forest the dingpatka forest and that had a huge impression on me for loving nature you know all the dark um, deep forest i thought it was dark and deep and now it <laughs> it has uh, 
trees have been cut down so much and they're so like not so dense anymore and also like all my relatives are scattered over upper Brahmaputra valley so that has a like uh, you always go to visit them and you pass through so many like natural uh, uh, ecosystems like that you know you go to dhola like i go to the side dhola you see the brahmaputra where you see the enormous you know uh, beach uh, like beach you can't really call that a beach but yeah sandy uh, places and um the enormity of the river so that's that the uh, and also you go to Dibrugar, you see, you feel the cold wind of the Brahmaputra on your face. Growing up, it was, uh, it played a huge part. And um, right now, uh, it's easy to get along with people uh, in the forest departments because I kind of know the vibe they have. I kind of know what kind of jokes to make the make to make them feel at ease with me in the forest because you know walking all day long in the forest makes you get tired makes you sometimes cranky when you're hungry and you have to lighten the mood yeah. and uh, all jokes don't work everywhere but I'm so lucky that I was born here and I know certain ways to say certain stuff to make them feel at ease so definitely it's a huge huge uh, plus point for me yeah my gosh i it's such a huge advantage for sure and i think mm -hmm. we don't realize when we're studying you know to be a researcher or anything like that we don't realize mm -hmm. the necessity of those soft skills no like just like you're saying mm -hmm. one simple joke or making a reference to something from from your childhood or you know it goes mm -hmm. such a long way to be from the system and i'm sure you must have so much more insight into that forest um now because mm -hmm. of that it changes you as a person also you know I used to be uh, a very uh, quiet person extremely reserved you more of an introvert than an extrovert but if you go into wildlife you have to talk to people like uh, Narayan sir says and I'll be quoting him a lot I guess now <laughs> you have to make yourself vulnerable to get other people vulnerable so if I don't open up to people they won't be opening up to me so I have to talk to them. So that's the part of me that has changed a lot. It has yet to change more because I am still growing as a person. So yeah, the soft skills are really important. Knowing the language is so important. That's, uh, that's really brilliant. And I'm sure like by the end of it, you're going to have some very keen insight because you've also seen the place change over the years as you've grown up. And like you're saying, you've seen so much of this happening and you know the place so closely and I'm sure that also contributes to how much you care and about all of the conservation work you know that you're doing in that area or you want to do in the future as well because of it um, and that kind of passion comes from being of that place of course um, and it's yeah. so it's wonderful to you know talk to you about it as well and even in the past when we've had conversations you're so passionate about it because you care so deeply for that place um, and that actually brings me to ask you a little bit more about some of the challenges this area is facing now and you're of course you know really in the center of it and you're very uh, keen on trying to fix a lot of these issues and trying to gather as much evidence that you need to make better changes in this area and um, most uh, mostly you know maybe we can even talk about what happened recently with the oil explosion in that zone while i was doing the study uh, i had to study like uh, three four groups actually there are 10 groups in the village itself uh, there are 10 groups but out of them three are singletons and two are like uh, couples and the rest are families. So uh, I had uh, one, the, one of the groups I was studying was a family. It was a family of three, like one adult male, one adult female and one um, like juvenile male. So they were a family, they were in the Motapung uh, village. So, you know, uh, this Hulagibans and Barakuri village, they're really friendly with people. So if you see them, your day really perks up. And like if you call them and just call out to them and have, like offer them a banana and they will come and take it from your hand. Wow. Really friendly, really friendly. It's the result of uh, the people's interactions, you know. 
it mm-hmm. didn't didn't come out come about easy but yeah so uh, when i was like studying them seeing their behavior and all the family seemed normal to me and they were normally swinging on the bamboo branches you know just walking walking on their two feet sometimes to do that <laughs> so like uh, they seemed healthy and seemed quite normal to me but her stomach was a bit swollen so i knew then that she was pregnant she was carrying a baby about barikuri village uh, the mor- the infant mortality rate is really high because you know the villagers told me it's because of electric uh, wires the electrocutions are very uh, you know frequently they occur in the village which result in the young ones dying out because they are not yet you know in control of their hands they don't have uh, full reflexes so that's what happens so i was observing that uh, group all day uh so but what and uh, i re- submitted a report about their behavior to the forest department and it was all cool but after a few months uh i got the news that uh the the female who had given who i had observed she had given birth to a baby a stillborn baby and before giving birth to the baby she had stopped eating for like four or five days she had stopped eating completely and after um, giving birth still birth to a stillborn baby she like disappeared people didn't see her for like four or so days and then they when uh, they collect so what they did was they collected a group of people and went looking for her like the area she used to she usually frequents and uh, they found her lying in the mud like she had fallen down dead she died and uh, so uh, that that uh, um i cannot like uh, say for sure that it was because of the oil spill but previously uh, before the oil spill there were other babies born and they were healthy and mm-hmm. still with their you know families given families but this one it was still born and the thing that uh, is odd is that it's the family that was closest to the oil uh, oil explosion no i see yeah so um, <clears throat> i haven't uh, personally seen the lab reports <laughs> but because they are confidential and even if they show me i couldn't tell maybe yet <laughs> until they publish it but the results will be there that her internal um, organs will have been maybe you know uh, they might have suffered some sort of damage you know and it ended up affecting her um, baby as well her infant and so so like uh, because of this explosion uh, like what should have been a happy healthy family with plus 1 added it went minus 2 see from 3 okay. to it went to 2 should have been 4 so um already the number of the hulagibons are dropping seeing as they are an endangered species you know and um uh, also it's against uh, endangering uh, like a uh, it's a schedule one species its habitat has been threatened so <laughs> in the wildlife protection act it's like illegal right to harm its habitat Absolutely. so uh, yeah i think it was a point of uh, it may have been a point of you know strong uh, evidence against setting up any more oil wells near such endangered um, animals uh, it uh, i hope that uh, um, so good thing i think uh, i heard about this through the vine that no more wells will be you know allowed to set up near barikuri for the time being for the time being <laughs> so so i hope that's true yeah so that's what happened in barikuri during the oil spill in my study yeah wow that's uh, that must have been really very heavy for you especially after watching them for so long and um seeing such mm-hmm. direct evidence for what is happening there uh, but i guess like you're saying it's some little victories that at least you were there to collect that evidence and you were able to prove 
that these species are genuinely being affected by it um mm. and i hope that this small victory leads to bigger ones later uh because it's amazing to see the kind of work you are all doing and the teams that are going there and studying these different species are also clearly you know really care for the system and are going back to keep track and check on it yeah they do they do they're doing a lot and i have to say it's thanks to the people as well they're uh they're so uh, you know they're open to sharing information with us if they didn't uh, let us into their village if they didn't let us see the hulokipans we wouldn't be able to collect such information and um uh, i go one i go like uh, only for a few days of research but the people are living with them and the effect the people actually care for this hula gibbons you know mm -hmm. they plant the orange trees banana trees for them they lay, <clears throat> lay they lay wait out uh, during meal times to give them their uh, like the fruits and biscuits or stuff to the gibbons so can you imagine how a little boy who always waits for just gibbons to give out something how he'll feel how he feels when they're disappearing day by day you know one day he might wake up and not hear a gibbon call in that village because we are destroying the environment so fast so that's even sadder for them mm -hmm. yeah so yeah it's like that um uh it's a similar similar story um i can tell about it uh because <clears throat> my my uh, ancestral home my father's home it was you know uh, very very close to the forest and it's um uh, it's near the uh, brusai park it's in hola so that area was like mesaki and all those areas they were completely forested areas just like you know 20 25 years ago it was like that 20 or 25 or 30 years ago like uh, people used to wake up hearing gibbon calls <laughs> they used to see black panthers right near their house <laughs> you know you uh, go out to the maybe to the loo at night and you might see a panther there it was very natural for them wow. but now researchers go looking <laughs> they don't find any they don't find any hula gibbons no monkeys there so it's a uh, a child uh, you know that child might grow up to be like my father in the future and not hear a given call you know yeah. it's it's a thing of perspective and it's so so sad to th even think that there might not be gibbons in that village anymore and i hope it doesn't happen so because there are mechanisms uh, that we can you know uh, that can be put in place to avoid such unfortunate deaths if we just you know make a you know more wiser choice yeah yeah and i think something which is very interesting in what you were just saying also is because there are of course so many different species which may or may not be endangered but some incredible biodiversity in these forests which we're just losing and maybe we realize it more with the larger mammals and maybe like you were talking about the earthworm you know we just mm -hmm. while it is so important and maybe we are losing them as well and we don't know exactly what the effects of that are yet but an ex like a story like what you just told me you know um when you look at a gibbon that looks so much like another human being that lives in these nuclear families you can see their little babies they have hands like ours and faces like ours and when people have such close interactions with them and that is lost i think for when it comes to sending that message across to a forest department or oil companies or you know the people who take these larger decisions who can potentially stop the destruction of these habitats mm -hmm. stories like this go such a long way right because even though it's mm -hmm. tremendously sad these are the kind of stories that are so hard hitting and that people actually think oh my god this is truly devastating and this is something that we need to fix and we cannot keep letting this happen and so i think it's it's so important that you're doing this kind of work and you're talking about it as publicly as you can and trying to get this out because you need i think these example stories to you know just convey the urgency and the importance of what is importance of what is happening yeah i agree completely with you 
you know one other thing i wanted to ask you is this i know it's also been a very conflicting uh, experience for you because you also have family who works with these oil companies right and you come from your your you live in a town which is an uh, an oil town and a mining town and you know all of these kind of things and you are doing the exact opposite of it where you're actually fighting people in your own family uh, <laughs> through all of this work so um, and i know you've also written some really scathing articles and some of which you've had to filter a little bit some of which you've not filtered and you just put out there um but what has that been like for you personally like as a as a person not necessarily even as a researcher but you know that must have been this must be really difficult for you on a personal level these battles that you're fighting ah <laughs> <laughs> that is a question that is going to be very hard to answer <laughs> but i'll try <laughs> mm. So the thing is yeah I come from a family where one of my parents <laughs> works in an oil corporation uh, but the thing is uh, he's an employee <laughs> mm-hmm. so yeah he doesn't take the decisions he just follows the orders so and uh, so you have got to do I see from his standpoint of view as well that he because of his uh, you know um, work because of his employment in that uh, corporation i could grow up so well you know i got the education that i did you know i have um, got gone to good institutions educational institutions met good friends uh, met good teachers who have helped shape the current me and uh, maybe if he hadn't worked in oil if he had been something else maybe maybe i wouldn't have gotten this education maybe i wouldn't have met these friends maybe i wouldn't have met been taught by these teachers and i wouldn't have become me what i am currently so i wouldn't choose it any other way <laughs> so he's doing his job i'll be doing mine mm-hmm. uh, yeah and uh, it's it's a thing of conflict i have to be very diplomatic i have to think for both sides i can't completely write from only emotions you know being very angry that the uh, given died and uh, being very angry that this has occurred that has occurred because of you know so and so i have to be diplomatic i have to be careful of my words and um i'm happy that i have mentors and friends who pull me back from <laughs> being a hot head you know <laughs> so i'm <clears throat> i'm really grateful for that so an initial draft of the article was um, <laughs> crude <laughs> i'd say <laughs> so but uh, thankfully um my mentor he, he you know gave me advice on how to improve upon it and i don't really want to you know tick anyone off the wrong way uh i just wish there's a way where we can you know that we can pave and make peace with both sides because uh, both sides are very necessary for the people like um uh i have to say thanks to oil because of because of their how much they've employed uh, the education in this area you know um it, it's because of that that many people here have got you know um income have good uh, daily wages are uh, earning earning well so many new businesses open up and the towns are flourishing in several townships because of oil so can't make them completely the bad guy you know uh for, I, we have to thank them for development but they have to also see what their development is doing to the natural ecosystems right uh, we have to you know collaborate we have to you know coordinate our activities that's the answer i think <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i i know this was a very difficult question to throw at you but um but considering mm-hmm. how you were able to answer that question in just 2 minutes i think you know you clearly had a lot of time to think about this <laughs> it's not the it's this wasn't an out of the blue question for you um yeah but but definitely i think this is uh, such important information for you to share with us and uh, thank you for all the work you do there and i really hope that things just get better and um, yeah thanks for speaking with me today and sharing these stories niharika <laughs> 
Oh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I'm very thankful to you too. It was very nice talking to you. It's always nice talking to you. <laughs> oh, likewise, Neharika. And I'm really hoping we get to keep having these conversations and uh, tell more stories as time goes. Oh yeah, I hope so too. Thanks for listening.